Let's give the Lord a clap offering for the wonderful testimony. We truly want to thank you for sharing your life and what God has done. Uh, in fact, today I'm, I'm not going to preach on the book of Revelation. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I didn't know the full content of what uh, Milena was going to share, but the message I prepared has to do much with it. In fact, the scripture text is Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13, the whole chapter about love. And I think this is one important subject that we have to come back to and think about as a church if we are to move forward. And uh, she has raised some very important points that I will I'll raise uh, as we go on through the sermon. So let's commit this time to God in prayer before we hear the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for the wonderful things that you do, Lord, in the lives of your people. Dear Lord, we, we go through a lot of hurt and we are oppressed, Lord, by so many things that is wrong with this world. But you are able to free us. You are able to draw us away from those things and give us life and make us new, Lord. And we pray that even as we hear your word, that we will be open, Lord, to your saving grace, to your great love. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me read the scripture text. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness come, what is in part disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. All right. Uh, we have heard this passage again and again, and it is read in the context of marriage. But we do understand that when you read it in the book of Corinthians, uh, Paul is writing to the church. The scriptures is addressing the church. And uh, one of the issues in the Corinth church was uh, they were clamoring for success. And I think every one of us wants success. Uh, you know, we want to be in a place where we feel safe, we feel whole, we feel complete. Uh, we, a place where we believe uh, that we will be happy. So, uh, I mean, there are a few questions that we need to ask ourselves before we, uh, you know, understand the place of God's love in, in this journey. And so, the questions would be like the ones you see on the screen. You know, how do you understand success? What it means to reach the top to you, okay, as a Christian? What does your path look like? What, what it requires for you to do and be, you know? And what are the things are you holding on to in this journey, and then, how are you doing in, in all of this? And the most important question, where is Christ in all of this? Is there a cross in this journey? Or is it all about what you think and what you believe this journey requires? Okay? So we, we have to think about the, these questions as we, we encounter this passage. It's kind of interesting uh, when you think about Christian success, uh, what it 
it, it involves, uh, as you read this passage, you'll be pretty surprised as how Paul speaks about it. So he, he says in the first section, you know, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So when we talk about being Christians, being spiritual, of course we would want to have the gift of tongues. Uh, we want to be gifted, you know, with great knowledge and prophetic insight. It'll be amazing, you know, when you know, people move in a gift of prophecy and tell you what God is going to do in your life and have words of wisdom to show you how to do it. And then if you have great faith, you know, it'll be exciting for people to have these dreams and visions that can move mountains, do great things, accomplish things for God. And of course, uh, great deeds of, you know, sacrifice, of giving, of, uh, you know, t taking on a life of difficulty and hardships is something that it's praiseworthy. And all this we would consider signs of being uh, a powerful, a successful, you know, Christian. But here, Paul was very emphatic when he says, uh, you know, that all this amounts to nothing without love, okay? These things are important, but when it's done by a heart that has not known the love of God, he says it very clearly, I am nothing, I gain nothing, <laughs> all right? And I think when you consider all the statements, it's kind of shocking, you know, how easy uh, for us to jump on this whole idea, oh, we have to do all these things. We have to sacrifice. I need great faith. You know, I need the powerful gifts of God operating in my life. But Paul is saying, you know, this does not work. And he was addressing the Corinthian church because they were all so caught up with these gifts. They were all so caught up with the display of power and abilities, you know. They were caught up with eloquence in speech and who is who and who can do what. Uh, that they had no sight of what ministry is all about because it is all about love. And if you think about it very carefully, you know, uh, just imagine this church and we start doing a lot of things and we just do it. But if there is no love for one another, if none of us have recognized the love of God, then what kind of place this church would be? If we as Christians proceed to just do and do, but our hearts have, been not, have not been touched by the love of God, what will we, you know, amount to? All right? And we see this again and again, and that's, you know, what, what the testimony touched on, and that's what I would want all of us to take stock. Because many times, we are so used to being Christians, we are so uh, used to talk. Uh, used to talk in, in talking about the Christian gifts and abilities and faith, that we forget that the heart of Christianity is the love of God that has changed us and the love of God that overflows from us to reach out to other people, all right? And so Paul puts it like this, you know, when he talks about Christianity, uh, it's, it, it's love. Uh, he says, he says in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And you can see, you know, his prayer, the emphasis here, the whole journey of Christianity, Christian growth, is all of us to grow in the depths, in the height, in the breadth of God's love together. This is what God invites us to do. 
This is the adventure of the Christian. You know, this is the journey of, of, of God invites us to be touched by that love. And he goes on to say in the same verse, he ends it this way. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. All right. So at the heart of what we do, who we are, is the love of God, God's love within our hearts, God lo- God's love changing us, God's love making us whole. But in many cases, what happens is that we get so caught up with so many other things and uh, we get so caught up by you know, holding things of the past, past hurts and desires and dreams, that we have no room for the love of God. All right? And because of that, we, we, we kind of redefine our faith in a way that does not help us. And that was the Corinthian church problem. Okay, They were thinking so much about performance and doing things that they had forgotten love. And Paul had to be very stern and strong in addressing them. And here he writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 to 7. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying. Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Okay, the context of this, uh, the Corinth church is, is you know, trying to measure who is the best speaker. Okay, so they're saying, oh, this guy is good. I follow Apollos. And then the other group will say, no, Paul is better, more theologically sound. I follow him. And they were comparing and, and, and you know, dividing into camps of who is who. And Paul had to say, hey, wait a, mi- a minute, all right? You know, the Bible does not talk about all these kind of things. The Bible is very clear, all right? And if you say that these are the things that make you different, who you follow, what you have, what you can do, your gifts, how does that make you different? Okay. And why do you stake a claim to it? After all, none of it belongs to you. And whatever you have was given to you by God. And yet you want to identify with these things and brag about it and say, these are the very things that make you different, all right? So he goes and he he begins to make the church think, you know, what are we holding on to make us different? You know, what do we say about ourselves that we take pride of, that we hold on to, that we say that we deserve uh, in our lives, and it gives us a license to pursue and do and say the things that you want to do. So in the Corinth church, a kind of arrogance came into their hearts because people were not thinking of the love of God. I can do, I can commit, I can say and speak according to my heart's fancy, all right, because I am important. And, and Paul says to them, already you have all you want Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and without us. And how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured. We are dishonoured. Okay. And Paul suddenly says, you know, your form of Christianity and my form of Christianity is pretty different. You seem to be talking about greatness, strength, victory, power, and so forth. But in our lives, we seem to be carrying the cross and going through so many difficulties. And here... Paul kind of highlights the scripture that we have two opposing ideas of Christianity. One that speaks about reigning, being rich, being wise, being strong and honoured. Well, there's another in practice was about being dishonoured, weak, fools, a spectacle and condemned. 
And Paul goes on to speak about the difficulty he faced. To this very hour, we are hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. When we have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. And he speaks very strongly, uh, you know, using uh, these words, these descriptions, about how he has embraced the cross. Now, we have to be clear about how we understand this passage, all right? It's about two opposing ideas, two different stories. You know, one, a group of Christians in the church, comfortable, you know, watching YouTube, saying which is the better speaker, what songs I like, what I like to do, when I want to come to church, when I don't want to come to church, what ministries I want to do, and so forth. And everything is centers around the self, and they would pursue gifted people, you know, uh, seek to be entertained by uh, people of power or, or people who are gifted, and so forth. The list goes on. A very self-preoccupied Christian. Where else Paul and the other apostles, they experience the love of Jesus Christ. And Paul speaks about how dark his life was and how he used to persecute Christians. And Jesus saved him. And he has become an apostle. You know, first he wanted to save the Jews and then the Gentiles. And it was not easy to, easy to be a Christian during that time. The Jews put a lot of pressure on, the, on its own people to turn away from Christ. They were persecuted, they were uh, thrown out of their families and so forth. And Paul saw all the brokenness and the hurting of these people. And he would go out of his way to stand with them, to love them and to care for them. And in doing that, he became the target for abuse and persecution. But all this he and the apostles did, if you, when you read the book of Acts or the other stories, was a labor of love because of the goodness of Christ in his heart, because of the love of Christ in his heart. And he would say things like, the love of God has compelled me to do these things. The love of God has led me to pray for you. The love of God, you know, seeks to go and help the poor and encourage the Christians who are suffering. And such a powerful overflow of love. And that's the thing, church, that I do want to remind all of us. You know, we can come to a place where we have such a narrow perspective of Christianity where we no longer are compelled by the love of Christ to care about what's going on in our broken world. We have no longer the energy to see God and remain in His presence. Just too caught up with the things that we want to do. And of course, we have things like prosperity gospel that celebrates the success and all these things again and again. And we can be caught up with all of this and say, yes, this sounds good. This is what I want. But forget at the heart of Christianity what this story is all about. And today, Melena told a very uh, difficult story about herself and something so horrible that has happened to her. And yet God could heal her. An unimaginable evil, and yet God could remove it. And so where are we in this story? Are we led by love? Are we driven by love? Or are we holding on to things, totally distracted to the reality of God's love in this broken world? Right. You know, a long time ago, uh, I, I think I heard someone speak of this word, and, and, and God is, 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 spoke to me a lot about it. You know, we all like to hold on to things, okay? They are like our pets, okay? Very cute, fluffy, nice, you know, you play with it and so forth. And we hold these things for joy, for security and so forth, okay? 
And now I'm, I'm not preaching against pets, I'm preaching against sin, okay? And, uh, and this is how we are, you know. And when, when, when God was speaking to me, there's so many things I was holding on to that did not help me. I was holding on to my anger, I was holding on to my pain, I was holding on to my pride, holding on to all my ambitions, and none of it has been given to God, okay? And because I will hold on to this thing, these things, I gripe, you know, I complain, I'm depressed, I get weary. And it happens again and again, you know, sometimes something happens and then uh, I'm tempted to hold on to the wrong things and it kind of sucks the life out of me, okay? And one thing I want you to, to tell you, you know, that whatever you're holding on to, that very thing actually takes up the place where God is supposed to be. I think a popular complaint and, and difficulty among all of us is that we can't read the Bible, we can't pray, we can't be with God. But many of the times, you know, the reason why we can't do these things is because we are not willing to let go of those things, those hurts, those desires uh, that we are holding on to. And as much as we hold on to it, we don't make room in our hearts to experience the love and the fullness of God. It's only when I, you lay your pain at the cross and what we heard in the testimony, it's only when we come to God, then God is given room to move in our hearts. And you see, in the Corinthian church, they're holding on to so many weird things. And that has taken the place of love and hope and life. Okay? And so when we are like that, you know, many Christians become very narrow in their thinking. You know, all they think is to do their one, two th things, you know, and it's the same struggles, the same difficulties again and again. Their world shrinks in, you know, on just to see what they feel, what they want, and they forget what's happening in the world around them. Okay? And they think all about safe spaces. And this Sin drives us towards selfishness and not love. And at the end, we find that a lot of the things we do is out of anxiety and fear. And the normal things in life uh, we hold on to with anxiety. For example, uh, even being a parent, my children, okay, there's, there was many times, you know, seasons when I would parent from a place of anxiety, I worry my sons will screw up their lives, will mess up, you know, they'll become bad guys, okay? <laughs> and, and things will go wrong. And then I will try to find out what's going on and I'll try to scold them and, and this and that and I'll get angry and i have an ill temper and I'll be, you know, in this, this horrible place. But God just looked at me and said, hey, what in the world are you doing here? You have lost sight of hope. You're trying to control everything. As if you did better. And that's how it goes. Fear, I won't have enough. Fear about how my career will go on. Fear about who will love me and who will care for me. And some parents hold on to their children. I want the love and acceptance of my children, so I give them all I want. You know, some children hold on to their parents and they don't want to grow up and they expect their parents to do everything for them. And there are so many examples of this. And you find that all these attachments, all this holding on, whether it's a sin or a hurt or a desire that is not of God, that does, is not shaped by God, kind of keeps us in a place, you know, where we cannot... <sighs> receive the fullness of God's love. And because of that, we struggle. And because of that, the pain continues to hold us in a place where we cannot move forward. All right. And so, when, when what the apostles and disciples did was they were stewards of grace and love. They have received the good news of freedom. They have walked with Christ. They have seen how Christ has changed them. 
You know, one time they were very preoccupied with silly things. You know, they used to sit with Jesus and they were wondering, okay, if he comes as a king, who will sit on his left-hand side and who will sit on the right-hand side? And then Jesus had to rebuke them and say, you get your mind out of all of this. This is not what is important. Look at what I'm doing and look at the cross and understand what love is. And they embrace the call to be stewards of God's love. All right. And that's the thing that happens. The more we receive the love of God, the more our sight broadens, the more we see things that is happening around us. I, I, God had to break so much of my self-centeredness and continue to do so by His love. I do remember this, 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 this story, and, um, and I'm saying this to make some points uh, for us to think about the kind of world we are and, and what God is doing. So at one point, I was sent to the Philippines to study, and, and during the time, I met some social workers and some people who was... Uh, uh, adri- uh, was doing an investigation on, on, on uh, ch- children being prostituted, okay? Uh, and, and they had stuff, and they, and they showed me, and it was horrible to hear and, and listen to all the stuff. And, uh, you know, your world changes when you realize there is so much suffering and abuse and wickedness in the world. But what's interesting is when they told me, the reason why this, this whole ring, this, uh, this child slavery and abuse ring is so protected because there's a lot of money in it. And the people, the prime customers are professionals from Japan, Korea, and Europe. And that's kind of interesting to hear because, you know, you would think, Oh, definitely successful people will not be involved in this this kind of things. You know, this is just a different world. It has nothing to do with the world of success and and prosperity. All right? And it's kind of interesting when I told the story to others, they also found it hard to believe that this was the case. All right? Until Epstein happened. Okay. I don't know if all of you have followed this whole Epstein story about how this guy had an island and he brought children and he prostituted them to royalty, to ex-presidents, to the greatest minds, you know, who develop all kind of business. Big names went to that island. And there are stories of abuse. And when I came back, um, you see, you see uh, what Melena shared, what happened to her. I think none of us know the pain and the destruction and the trauma that evil causes and in, in, in its depth, and we, we don't take it seriously enough. And because of that... Uh, We don't understand how important the love of God is in this story. We kind of just walk over all of this and say, all right, as long as I have what I want and as long as I hold on to my pets, this world will be okay, I will be fine. But there's a whole different, you know, world there that is broken, that is hurting. People are praying. People are crying out. They're living in abusive conditions. They don't know what to do. They come to their ends. They receive so much trauma that they're, they're, uh, you know, facing depression and fear and self-loathing and so forth. The list goes on. But the sad thing is You know, the church does not have the heart of God to capture the stories and to seek the love of God so that we can respond to these people, bringing hope and life into their hearts. 
In fact, some of us have forgotten how the love of God can bring hope and life into our own hearts. And so the apostles gave themselves to this. They went forward, they preached, they shared, and they endured hardships. And this is the right context of understanding what it means to embrace the cross. It is a story of love. It is a, a, a task rooted in the love and the richness of God's goodness. It's a story of hope, of life. And so this, this passage says it, you know, it is a love that is patient. It's a love that is kind. It's a love that does not envy and does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. But it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And that's what God ushers us into, this place of love. All right? And these, this is the life God has called us to live, you know. A life moved by the love of God that shapes our faith and our hope. We don't want to be motivated by fear and anxiety. We don't want to do the things in life because we are under fear. We don't want to teach fear to the people around us and to our children and tell them, you know, this is how hopeless life is. You better protect yourself. But we want to be the ones who tell them, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Fear the Lord, you holy people, for those who fear Him lack nothing. We want to speak about a different kind of fear that speaks about goodness and life. As the psalmist says, I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And church, we need that love. And as we heard in the testimony, Day to day, God calls us to take that object that we're holding on to, the pets that we're holding on to, the excuses that we're holding on to, and bring it to the altar and say, Lord, I'm going to lay it at the cross, and I want you to set me free. Day to day, we want to remove, our, strip ourselves of our pride and selfishness for one reason, you know, because we have seen what the love of Christ can do in our hearts and in others. But if we no longer see that, then it gets really sad, doesn't it, church? And so, church, I do want to challenge you. You know, we talk about the church plans. What is our plan? Okay. Building, new ministries, whatever it is. Our most important plan is you. It is you who are the light of the world. It is your story that God is going to use to touch the people around you. And God is patient and God calls us all to endure a journey where all of us are shaped to be that instruments of love and to build a congregation that overflows with the love of God. And together we seek God to give us opportunities and open our eyes and open doors for us to bring healing and hope to a broken world outside. If we don't have that, then we don't have anything else. And I know this journey is hard, it's long, but God is good. He is not giving up on you. Don't give up on Him. God loves you with an unending, sacred, steadfast love. Allow your heart to, build, to be filled with that love. Let go of the things that stand in the way so that God can move us forward. And that's the song and the story that we heard today. His love can do this. So church, I do invite you, you know, to come to this place where you allow His love to shape your faith and to bring hope into this place. Let us pray. 
We praise you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Dear Lord, we, we thank you, dear God. Um, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for speaking to us. And dear Lord, we have come to this place and some of us are stuck. Some of us are preoccupied with so many different things. Some of us are burdened with so many things, Lord. And all of this has crowded out your love in our hearts. And we no longer find joy in you, Lord. And because of that, we have nothing much to give, Lord. We are just controlling our borders, keeping people out, Ensuring things are good for us. And there's no place for dreams and sacrifices and hope. We don't sense the motivation, the deep desire, Lord, to do, to give, to care. And some of us are tired of doing this as, as a duty. And we want more of you, dear God. Lord, change this, dear God. Let us be set free from these things that hold us back. Bring us to your altar. Bring us into your presence that once again we will find joy and healing and wholeness. That we will know what it means to be held by your hands. That we will be acquainted with the Father's great love. Embraced Paul is his children. And what we do will be an overflow of the richness of your love. Dear God, we pray that the coming days and months, Lord, that there will be breakthroughs in this church. That we will no longer be so caught up in our small, tiny world, Lord. But we will see your kingdom come, your will be done. We'll see the new creation. We'll see rivers in the desert, Lord, bringing life. We will hear songs of hope, Lord. Because of who you are, Lord Jesus. Dear Lord, the worst kind of evil you have taken upon yourself at the cross therefore nothing Lord can separate us from your love so draw us back into your love Lord Jesus we praise you Lord. 